Hello everyone, good evening. Um, I'm Vaishnav Achat from Texas Instruments. And today I would like to talk to you about accelerated porting of uh, Linux, U-Boot, and Yocto for production-ready embedded systems. I work with the Linux team at Texas Instruments, and Texas Instruments has a long history of contributing to open source, and we think upstream and open, open source ecosystem in the device architecture space itself. As part of my, I think the HDMI cable is loose, sorry. Hey, sorry. Uh, so as part of my daily work, I work with Linux kernel and U-boot development for TI processors. I'm also the maintainer for TI platforms in Zephyr Autos. So Kirti is the co-author of this presentation, and he'll be joining uh, with us over remote. Kirti works as a software application engineer with TI, and he has supported multiple customer platform bring-ups in his more than last 15-year career with TI. And he was also an active contributor to the Linux kernel, working on Bandcap and GPIO drivers. So in this talk, we would like to share the basic steps you will need to do to get U-Boot Linux and Yocto running on your platform from the lessons we have learned from multiple past bring-ups and practices we followed to make our journey efficient. So the talk is split as follows. Initially, we will discuss a few challenges on why it's not straightforward to uh, port uh, and support the different permutations of hardware you have uh, on U-Boot, Linux, and Yocto, uh, in addition to the basic uh, bring up challenges. And then uh, we discuss on steps to bring up U-Boot, Linux, and Yocto on a new, new hardware platform where they, uh, on a new SOC. Uh, and then we discuss on how we bring, bring up U-Boot, Linux, and Yocto on a new hardware platform where the SOC vendor have already provided you the support. And in the end, we also look at some case studies of efficient tools and techniques that the recent upstream uses. Uh, and the most of the focus here is on bootloader because that's where the people face difficulties during new platform bring-ups. So there are a few disclaimers. So, uh, so we go through a few references and examples. So we just say it's one of the ways you can solve the problem. We don't claim that as the best practice. All the examples we discuss here are picked from upstream accepted solutions. And the accelerated porting, we mean, so we have talking about uh, techniques and strategies to reduce duplication of effort when adding new platforms and not the getting the fastest port out. So coming to the motivation of giving such a talk. So there are already a lot of talks available about how to bring up U-Boot or Linux on a new platform. So we want to focus not only on the bring up, but maybe uh, shed some light on the, the challenges that uh, SOC manufacturers and the hardware platform vendors are facing. So bringing up the uh, U-Boot and Linux and Yocto on a new SOC and new, new board can be challenging. And in addition to the normal challenges of getting things to work, we also have the challenges of supporting multiple SOCs in the same family, different SOC variants. There, are, there can be cut down SOC versions. And these are the challenges you can face as a SOC manufacturer. And on the boards or hardware side, hardware platform side, you have different ki kinds of board architectures. You have a single PCB EVM, you can have a SOM plus baseboard kind of platforms uh, and different, uh, and there can also be system in packages where you have SIPs, where you have the SOC, the DDR, the PMIC, uh, RTC, everything packaged into a single package. So how uh, do we support all these combinations in a sustainable manner? So whether you are an SOC manufacturer or a hardware platform vendor or a customer, who try, uh, who want to solve this problem, you usually have a common goal. So you want to introduce new platforms with minimal duplication in source code and effort. And the 
now the customers are not demanding just a drop of software when the SOC is released. So they want the product cycle, the support along, uh, continues along the product cycle, which spans more than a decade on most cases. And there could we need to have a scalable implementation where someone new can have add a new hardware platform based on your SOC that you're putting. So just to shed some light on these challenges we are facing in TI. So if you look at the TIM 6 SOC family, so we have different variants of the devices. So there, there can be uh, a variant with single A53 cores. There could be variant with four A53 cores. There can be variants with a GPU. Uh, there can be variants without PR. PR is a real-time controller in this process. So there are multiple combinations from the same SOC family. Then there can be system in package where the DDR, the PMIC, the RTC, EEPROM, everything is integrated into the package. And then we, we have the exact same SOC, but maybe due to the eFuse configurations or the uh, OTP configurations, they behave differently to the software. For example, the security enforcement. So some devices based on the con permanent configuration, they, can, they don't need signed or encrypted images to work. And uh, some devices, uh, we, we need signed and encrypted images to work. So when you look at it from a high level perspective, it, these are the exact same devices. But when you go and look at it, the bootloader, you need to have an, a, a, a complete different signed images to make these two de devices work. But how do you go about adding the support without duplicating the effort? And if you look at the hardware platform on both sides, you can have single PCB EVMs. And if you look at the right end, you have two devices that uh, are very similar in features, but goes to two different markets, the industrial and the automotive market. And you can see that there are differences in the expansion connectors and all. So uh, <coughs> then we need to ha have a way to support all these combinations in a sustainable manner. And if you don't have a strategy, we'll just go and duplicate all this uh, and create a new platform, consider all of this as a new platform. And that becomes a mess to support later. So if we have fixes coming in, you might miss in one of the platforms, but underlying hardware is actually similar or the SOC is similar. So first we'll talk about how we'll work on bringing up a new SOC. So we can think about bringing up the software and an SOC when we have the silicon available. But sometimes it's too late to start thinking about software and the silicon is available. For example, you might have some critical use cases that you want to validate before the silicon is available. So you can, so uh, uh, a commonly used practice in the industry is to start validation of software on a simulator where you have the implementations uh, of the uh, SOC in, a, in software, but it's not a cycle accurate model and you cannot do performance analysis or maybe com do a complete use case analysis. And you can maybe develop frameworks and accelerate your initial development faster. Then we can do the um, software validation on a hardware emulator where you have cycle accurate models and you can do the actual device driver development you can boot up Linux and validate, boot up U-boot and Linux and validate your stack. And, um, and even you can run performance and use case analysis there. And if you ha have a strategy to uh, perform the uh, software validation on a simulator or an emulator, it can actually accelerate and help your uh, software bring up, uh, bring up on when the actual silicon is available. So there was an interesting talk on during the embedded Linux conference last year, where my coworker Brian explained how we perform mainline Linux development on our platforms before the silicon is available, and how that's helping us uh, making the complete process of software bring up efficient. So coming to you have a new SOC and you want to bring up the bootloader, and we are focusing on the U boot. So first you'll need to understand the boot sequence or the boot architecture of your platform. So your platform may have different boot architecture. Your ROM may load up uh, the startup core in different ways. So I'm taking an example where we have an ARM V7R R5 startup core and how the U-boot starts up. So we have the entry point at the start.s assembly 
code where we have the architecture specific and sometimes it can be even your uh, CPU specific initialization where maybe you can you have a dual core cluster of RFA, you disable the second core for boot up, all those things you perform there. And it's uh, the uh, minimum basic uh, functionality you need to reach to the uh, U-boot board in it F. So how did we reach start in, uh, start dot S, the entry point there? So that's what your ROM, uh, the bootloader does, and that will be different according to different platforms. But the, the rest of the flow in U-boot will be sim similar for even if you go to a different architecture also, it will be looking similar. So on most of the SOC platform you want to add supports, you will just need to add support on this something called a board init F. That's where you have to initialize your SD RAM and your serial console. And But it might not end there. So if in order to get your serial and your SD RAM, you might need to have your dependencies also initialized and set up properly. And you don't ha have uh, BSS or you cannot have global variables in this board in ETF and you have the stack in SRAM. So you are having a very limited environment to just initialize your DDR and serial console. Then uh, you, you, would, you would returns from the board in ETF and it jumps to the board in it R. So at this point you have your DDR initialized and your uh, stack and global data is relocated to EDR, uh, DDR. And in the SPL stage, we don't relocate the code to DDR, but in the normal prop, U-boot proper stage, we execute the code from the top of the DDR. So most of the bring ups you will be, uh, the first uh, challenge you'll be facing will be fixing things in the board in it F. And that's where you have to get your DDR initialized and your serial UART initialized. So uh, from the U-boot documentation, the U-boot documentation only suggests to initialize the preloader console or the serial console and just the DRAM. But you might need dependency sorted out and uh, in, in order to uh, initialize the DDR and preloader console. For example, you, in, when, on, during the startup, your, the MMR registers might be locked. So you might need to perform an unlock to write to those registers. Then there could be architecture specific initialization. For example, if you have a R5 kind of core, you need to initialize the memory protection unit regions according to your configuration. Then you might, you, for example, if you look at the multi-core heterogeneous processors, there could be a chance that you have a system controller or a central controller who, which manages power clocks and all, and there could be a security controller which is common to the SOC. So you might need to load the custom firmware and start up and initialize those remote processors before you are actually able to do any general purpose functionality on your bootloader. Then there can be firewalls. So the memory regions, the uh, there is configuration register regions could be firewalled and locked and you might not have access to uh, write to those regions or read back from these regions. So you might need to configure firewalls to enable your bootloader to function properly. Then you might have the same build of U-boot working on different hardware platforms. For example, we have the same U-boot build working on one of our EVMs and maybe smaller starter kits, all the same exact U-boot build. So we'll pack the different device trees and different DDR configurations to the same image and uh, we'll be picking the device tree based on the board detection logic. So you'll, you need to do all this before configuring the DDR because the DDR configuration usually is a very big chunk of registers, uh, right? And it depends on the controller. Uh, and uh, only if you select the correct DDR configuration according to your platform, your DDR initialization will be successful. Then you, you can come to the preloader console initia initialization. You, it's assuming you have already have a serial driver present and now you have all the dependencies sorted out for having the power, clocks, pin marks, everything for your serial. And then you go to the uh, SDRAM initialization. And there could be also cases like you want to have some miscellaneous or advanced features that you need to enable very early at the boot. For example, some features like AVS, the adaptive voltage scaling, you need to have that set up uh, as early as in the boot, uh, which is the hardware recommendation. So you might also need to implement functionalities like that. So that's what you will need to 
do to uh, customize your board in a tough, you'll need to initialize the DDR. So the, I'm not going to the detail of the specific DDR control configuration. Uh, and now I'll go to some details on how you can have, so U-Boot provides a lot of uh, weakly defined functions in the bootloader implementation, which you can override to customize for your platform. So first one of them is the SPL boot device. So you, the, most of the platforms will have different boot modes from where your uh, boot, uh, bootloader is booting from. And uh, your hardware may have maybe registers or some configuration which you can read from and tell you boot that you are booting from a spy flash on a spy or you are booting from an MMCST card, which is necessary for the, we, U-Boot needs the context for to fetch the next bootloader from which uh, media to boot from. Then we have uh, SPL board in it, which is also a weakly defined function you have, you can override in your board specific files. And uh, for example, you can, your PMIC could have an error signaling module and you can, you perform the initialization of the ESM in the board in it. Then you might need to perform fix-ups based on your platform. Maybe you do the board detection based on, you have multiple boards running the same configuration and uh, you want to fix up. For example, you have a controller that's muxed out. Uh, so so you, you have something like a spy controller, which is muxed to two different spy flashes and there is a mux on, switch on the board. And you need to tell you boot to initialize one of them based on your dip switch configuration. So you need to do this, these kind of fix-ups in your board, board in it. And uh, no, sorry, in the uh, perform fix-ups. And you need to tell you boot the size of the DDR bank information. Uh, you, you can either fetch it from your device to your, if your hardware provides other features for auto detection, you can fetch it and uh, uh, tell you boot what's your uh, DRAM uh, bank information. Then we are coming into the, so you are booting from U-Boot, you are boot, booting to the high level OS or Linux and you need to fix up the uh, device tree based on your platform. So for example, you, you have something called FT system setup where you have, you want to fix up features of the SOC. Uh, like, like we discussed earlier that there could be uh, device variants with lesser number of application cores, device without a GPU and all those. So we can fix up the device tree uh, using the FT system setup override function. And you, if you want to uh, do a board level fix up, or for example, we discussed the, the different spy flashes muxed uh, and connected to a single controller and you need to uh, select it according to the dip switch configuration. So you'll use the FT board setup override for this. So these are the main override you will need to define in your board specific or the SOC specific platforms to get your uh, uh, changes uh, working on your custom platform. So with, with uh, this set of changes, you should be ideally be getting a U-Boot, uh, working U-Boot, because you, if you look at the board in it R or the U-Boot proper, most of the code is not platform specific. It's all the common code. And uh, if you have the device drivers for your uh, boot media and the uh, peripherals that you use during the bootloader. And with this set of overrides, we are able to get uh, most of the platforms getting up to your U-Boot proper console. And now next I'm switching to how you can bring up Linux on a uh, new platform. Uh, so the discussion is around platforms where you are not introducing a new platform where you are not introducing a new architecture or new device family. Our discussion is around where we have a device family where present and we are adding a new SOC to the same family. So bringing up Linux once you have U-Boot working is mostly easier because you have access to all debug utilities and and it you don't need to have uh, make a lot of changes to get uh, Linux working. So one of the things you need to take care of before uh, uh, trying to get Linux working is to make sure that your SDRAM is stable. So if you face issue, if you have, you don't have a proper stable DDR configurations and you start bringing up Linux, you can see random failures happening when you boot up Linux. 
So you need to make sure at the U-Boot proper stage itself uh, that your SDRAM is stable and U-Boot provides a uh, command called mtest, um, the memory test, and you can configure to read write, uh, perform read-write tests on your SDRAM and make sure that it's stable. So if you want to add support to a new platform, it's uh, adding the uh, new bindings for your platform uh, and then adding your device tree. Uh, so you initially, it's recommended to start with the minimal device tree where you have your boot, uh, the cores that are running Linux and also your serial console and minimal peripherals so that you don't face issues during boot and you see failures during boot. So and then it's also recommended so uh, we can have your init file system uh, taken from different boot media. But if you, you once you have the U boot uh, brought up, uh, it's recommended you, you can try loading a RAMFS, minimal RAMFS, and get to a, a minimal RAMFS console by preloading and, and configuring that uh, the, the RAMFS address and size in the device tree. And then one of the things that you need to take care of is you have a minimal device tree, but some of the times the same SOC family could have, uh, the, the drivers could have something that's not directly visible from the device tree. Like it might not be directly visible that some features are enabled. For example, you have the, the DVFS, the power management uh, drivers where the implementation and the, the, how they are enabled is using the same compatible as your SOC. So sometimes when you bring up a new hardware platform, your SOC vendor would have already put that compatible in the driver, but you don't see exactly in your uh, device tree that you have DVFS enabled. So you need to look for things like that. And some of the drivers use the SOC identifications to configure parameters. So you might need to, uh, implement your SOC identification uh, uh, implementation so that your, uh, there could be some driver data that's picked based on your SOC ID or JTAG ID. And if you are seeing any failures, so usually it's recommended to start with the ARM64 or the, your architecture specific default config. And if you're failing, seeing issues with the default config, it, it's recommended to maybe disable some of the advanced features like runtime power management and enable more debug features where you have access to more debug utilities. So for example, I talked about you, you might have some hidden things that's getting enabled before, without you even knowing or putting up in the device. You, you try to create a minimal device tree, but there are things that got enabled because the SOC vendor has put those as defaults that are enabled for the SOC. One example is the, the CPU frec or the DVFS power management, where you are, the SOC vendor usually puts your uh, SOC compatible as the, uh, in, the, uh, the, in the driver match. And as soon as you create a new platform with the same SOC compatible, the match happens and you have your DVFS enabled in your basic bring up, bring up which you might not actually need, you, you, you might not be intending to do that. So you need to be careful about these things in the uh, platform, the, the device drivers. So this is the main uh, basic things you need to do for bringing up Linux. Now next, we are going to switch to how you can bring up Yocto. Uh, so for a basic bring up, bring up, it's recommended you use your SOC vendor's same file system and do the customizations later once you have a system that boot, boots up first. So for the devices that we are discussing where there is already the families, the SOC family is already supported and or the, the SOC is supported and you are adding a new hardware platform, the Yocto, the machine configuration for Yocto should be very minimal and you are only you should ideally need to only add overrides necessary for your particular platforms. So for example, you might need uh, overrides for your boot image files. Maybe you have uh, some security enforcement. Uh, so you might be not be using the exact same device. You some, Sometimes the default platform might be a secure device and you want to 
uh, you are move, switching or bringing up a general purpose device so you might need to do that and also you might need to uh, add the rec extra recommends package uh, list where you you are adding the list of packages that needs to be installed as default of the image and most of the times if you are bringing up a uh, new soc uh, you will have the binary so uh, the uh, the firmware binaries, you can have a system controller, you can have different remote processors, all those firmware binaries might change according to your new device. And whenever you, you will have, so you will uh, you need to make sure that all of the recipes you need uh, from the SOC vendor, so have the compatible machine, so you are adding the compatible machine entry for your platform to all of the recipes you need so that it's also getting included and built. So these are the steps uh, uh, maybe summarized for a new SOC, we are adding support for a new SOC. So now we can have a uh, look at where you want to add a new board support so or a new EVM or a, a support where the SOC support is already So We'll focus on the deltas, uh, what you might need to do for a new board support. So, uh, so the on the board specific changes, mostly it will be so you your power path or the power tree that you choose might be completely different from what your uh, reference or the the what you have it in the reference BSP. So you need to make sure that you have the right set of changes for your PMIC or the maybe you have discrete regulators. So you should have that power tree properly configured in your device tree. And most of the cases when you change the boards or you might may pick a new DDR part, you will have a different DDR configuration that you might need to update for your platform. And you might need, you may have to choose to have a different serial console than what the SOC vendor provide, provides. So you should be careful that you need to make sure that you, if you are switching the serial console, you should switch the pin marks. You should make, make sure that the power clocks, everything for the uh, serial device is available. Uh, you are making the right changes to have that available. And uh, the, uh, if you have the choice of uh, selecting the boot media before, then it's recommended that you choose a flash or the uh, flash media where you can flash it independently out of the board. So sometimes you uh, have an uh, the a spy flash on the board and you don't have a way to properly flash the spy without the board brought up initially. So if you have an MMC, ST, if, you have, if you can afford to have an SD card boot mode and you, you are flashing the image just to the SD card from outside, so it helps you ensure that there is no issue in, in the process where you write the images to the uh, boot media. If you cannot afford that, UART boot mode is one of the simplest boot mode that UART uh, U-Boot supports. And you can have map the same, exact same console where you get the boot logs to have, get your binaries over X modem or Y modem protocol and continue boot up. It's very slow, but it's very simple and there is very uh, less chance of failure happening in UART boot mode. So, uh, now, with those steps, you will be able to get U-Boot working. And if you are uh, trying to bring up Linux on a custom board uh, and where there the SOC support is already provided by the vendor, the first and foremost thing you will need to ensure is the DDR stability. And you should make sure that your DDR is stable uh, at your U-Boot console itself using the memtester command. Uh, and it's recommended to have the early console print so that if, let's say, you uh, you are uh, boot up is failing before uh, Linux is able to initialize the, your serial device. It's, and you can get some console prints if you uh, set up the early consoles. And how that works is you boot sets up the serial uh, uh, device configuration and uh, Linux just uses those uh, uh, the RX and TX registers and just writes to them. Linux will not initialize the UART, but you, it will use a pre-initialize UART and give the early prints in case you are, you are initialization itself fails uh, during Linux boot up. And also make sure to have, you have your proper boot args in your device tree or your, if you are passing the boot arguments to, uh, through U-boot or through device tree, you need to make sure you have it correct. 
And if you're in it or the, your, the boot media is not uh, properly, uh, the in it is not provided properly uh, to Linux, you, your boot can hang and stop uh, before the init starts. And also, again, similar to doing an SOC bring up, it's recommended to have a very minimal device tree. And you, you can have a big device tree, but keep all of the uh, peripherals and the nodes that you don't actually require for a minimal boot. It's recommended to keep it disabled and enable one by one and validate them. And also, you might need to, if you have a multi core, heterogeneous multi core processor, it's better to have. Uh, all of the remote processors also disabled so that it does not, those cores does not go and maybe overwrite anything that Linux needs on, overwrite anything on the DDR that Linux is using. And these are some of the issues that we have seen the customers reporting uh, when they are doing an initial uh, uh, board bring up. So one of the main uh, problems that you don't, in, it's very difficult to debug is you have DDR stability failures. So you will have your Linux crashing at very random places and it might, uh, you might not be able to reproduce the crash sometimes. So it's, uh, so we usually recommend to run the mem tester in U-boot, maybe an overnight or over a weekend, you do it continuously so that you have uh, ensured that your DDR configuration you have is uh, uh, stable. And Sometimes, so we discussed this already, sometimes the SOC vendor might enable something, you don't actually see it on the device tree, like the DVFS or the, some, the configs may have runtime power management, you can see failures due to that. So it's recommended to have a minimal config to, uh, uh, so that uh, there are no failures due to those. Uh, then you you have the, you you may even have your console failing, so there could be uh, multiple causes for a console failing. You might not have power clocks or pin marks for the console, or even maybe the interrupts for the uh, uh, UART instance are not getting registered. So we are just going through some case studies or examples and what some advancements happening in upstream that helps you streamline and make your process efficient. So first thing is, so we discussed some challenges where you have a lot of SOC variants, different configurations, and you need to add the support for these platforms in a sustainable manner. So one of the challenges is you have different kind of bootloader images that you need to support for a same SOS family. So you have a general purpose device, you have a secure device, and you need to create the bootloader binaries without maybe having the signing or the uh, encryption steps customized for your platform. So U-Boot has a tool called Binman, which solves this problem through device tree configuration. So you have, you describe how you want the binary. So you might need a, so for example, here you can see that the content field of this, so that the TI boot tree is our initial bootloader. Uh, and I, in this uh, uh, description, I'm describing the contents of the, that bootloader. You need to have the U-boot SPL, then you need to have the certificate, then you need to have, uh, some of the configurations that the, your ROM or your bootloader might use. So you can pack all these and you can create multiple uh, permutations of this Im image according to, let's say you have a general purpose device, you need to pack these, these components. You can have a secure device where you need to have a different set of uh, uh, images packed together uh, to have your uh, binary. So, uh, the binman solves the problem of having, having like maybe custom signing scripts and you can have different platforms supported from a single binman DTSA configuration. And usually if your SOC vendor provides for all the variants, if you are doing a new hardware platform, you might not even need to touch the, uh, the bootloader image generation. Then till maybe the six months back, the U-Boot had uh, a separate uh, device trees that has been continuously been synced with uh, the Linux kernel. So recently there is a feature being added uh, called OIF upstream. There was a talk today morning about that by Sumit. So the, 
main crux behind OF upstream is that there is a device tree rebasing repo that's maintained by the Linux device tree maintainers. So they have a, a rebased device tree that other projects can make use of. Uh, uh, and U-Boot is moving to have, have the device tree rebasing repo as a subtree inside U-Boot. And we uh, don't go and add a uh, new device tree for separate device tree for U-Boot uh, like we did maybe six months back. So you don't need to keep rebasing and syncing device trees each kernel cycle uh, to U-Boot uh, manually. So you just need to get your device tree accepted in the mainline Linux kernel and it will come through the device tree rebasing repo to your uh, upstream U-Boot. So you don't need to upstream any U-Boot uh, device specific device tree unless you need to have some U-Boot specific overrides. So then another challenge is you need to have support different ways of booting. So you need to have maybe support booting Android, but and you need to have some configs that are specific to booting Android but you don't want to blot your normal configuration with this Android configuration. So U-Boot supports something called the def config fragments where you can keep the config specific to the Android boot as a fragment and then use uh, that along with the, your base uh, config and have a, a system where you don't blot the uh, default configuration with the Android configs and you, if you want Android, you just apply this fragment on top of this default configs. Now coming to, so we discussed a lot of challenge. So we discussed, uh, we, we may have platforms without GPU, without lesser number of cores. And we discussed overrides that U-Boot provides uh, to fix up your device tree. So this is very much useful in cases where your device variants are uh, indifferent to U-Boot. So you, if you have a uh, four application cores or eight application cores, it does not matter to U-Boot uh, at all. It's a bootloader that just runs on single core. And if your platform has a GPU or not, or an accelerator or not, it does not matter to U-Boot. In those cases, you just need to fix up the device tree that you pass to uh, the Linux uh, Linux kernel, and you can use the FT system setup system setup because it's it's a SOC uh, specific features that you are overriding, and if you are overriding both specific features, you will use the FT board setup override, and this helps in not duplicating the device tree for each cutdown or each variant of your device. So you can make use of your device uh, features. You, your device may expose some feed capability or feature registers where it can tell you how many uh, application cores it has or it has a GPU or not. And you can read those registers and override your device tree according to that. So now uh, you have a superset or a subset SOC which you have already upstream the support and you have the support available. Now you know that the, your device is a subset of or superset of the device. So normally you can you can maybe do, just forget about reuse and go and add the entire new device tree uh, as a new com completely new SOC. But it's useful and recommended uh, to have uh, an analysis whether you can reuse existing device tree. So for example, this is one of the recent platforms we upstream where we have uh, the base uh, so a subset platform already present in upstream and the superset platform has uh, additional features and it's memory map compatible. So we don't just go and duplicate the entire device tree. So we just inherit the device tree of the subset or superset platform and you either delete nodes from the platform or you add the overrides. Okay, so that's the end of the case study. So. Uh, so there are a lot of useful, U-Boot provides a lot of useful utilities or commands where you can maybe check the pin marks, toggle GPOs, which might be useful in bring up. So let's say you have a device that you want to bring up, you need to toggle the reset of the GP, uh, reset GPO of that device from U-Boot. So they, I have listed down a few commands that are useful during bring ups. I'm still updating the list. And so these are this is useful only if you have uh, you, you are reaching up to the U-Boot console. So many times uh, you, you might not even reach there, you might even get stuck in the, your board in it F before your 
serial console is initialized. So at that times you will need to use a JTAG debugger and go and debug. Uh, and uh, so there are some details on the link on how you can debug U-Boot and Linux using OpenOCD and with GDB. So just summarizing whatever we discuss. So we, if we start the bring up uh, or the validation on a simulator, it's very helpful to validate the software when your silicon arrives. And it's be best to start your baseline with an, the upstream baseline. So you, you, whenever you start your uh, preparing your code base for your new device, it's best to start with the latest upstream baseline so that you can once you have your device ready and you make your changes, it, you can easily uh, send those, uh, make the changes and uh, send those patches upstream. But if you pick a very old kernel of your, or if you are the vendor tree is very old and you start with those, that tree, and it, it might, you might have the inertia to not port those patches to the upstream and not post it upstream. So it's better to start upstream, uh, start using the upstream code base as early as possible. And, if you are adding new features or new subsystems or frameworks, it's uh, recommended to have that posted upstream first. And if it's um, uh, the more complex the feature is, it's better to have this solution posted upstream so that we have the feedback from the community. So if we have we are, don't do that and we release those solutions to the customers and the community does not agree with your solutions, and it does not look good and you it's very difficult to go and fix something that you have already shared with your customers and your customer uh, the community does not agree with that and if you are making linux device tree changes make sure to follow the device tree uh, coding the, the dts uh, the device tree has a coding guidelines recently added uh, which is available in the bindings dts coding style document and also make sure to run the binding checks and dtbs check on new device trees you are adding and uh, even though it might look counterintuitive, it's better to add your Linux device tree first uh, and then have that uh, same device tree derived to U-Boot through OF upstream. Uh, if, if you are locally developing, you can have the device tree rebasing repo uh, patched with your device tree and use the same device tree as Linux. Uh, but if you go, maybe you do the Linux, uh, bootloader bring up before thinking about Linux bring up. So, but uh, the upstream ex does not accept a separate device tree for U-Boot, so it might be difficult to fix it later. So it's better to start with the Linux device tree, derive that for U-Boot, and continue with the bring up. And also maybe you, you so that you don't miss the features like binman or upstream and all, you need to be active in the community and continuously make changes to your platforms according to the standards that the community is offering. Okay, thank you. I'm done with the presentation. If you have any questions.